we kept here on the class uh, on Monday, on Tuesday, sorry. We were looking at um, the initial derivation of the, the, the forces that affect a particle in an unhindered environment. So this is a particle in a very unusual situation, uh, which we don't normally see, but it's a baseline for which we're going to use to understand sedimentation. And we were looking at the derivation for the terminal velocity of that particle. So that particle, when it starts to settle, very quickly reaches its terminal velocity. And the equation we ended up with is at the bottom of the slide over there. The only issue we had was that that function, uh, the CD, um, the, the drag coefficient, is a function of the velocity itself. So that equation can't be solved uh, directly. It's, it's an iterative approach to solve for the, for the terminal velocity. Um, if you make the assumption that you're in a, in a region where the Reynolds number is less than 1, then you can solve it directly using that equation over there. Um, you're, it removes the velocity dependence. So the main, the main reason why we're after terminal velocity is that's, that's the key criteria that we're going to use to design the size of our sedimentation units. So in today's class, we'll, we'll look at the equations for designing the cross-sectional area of the sedimentation basin. That's the key design parameter, is the area of, of that sedimentation vessel. And the terminal velocity is what's going to limit that area. So it is an important value to add. Then we ended off the class by discussing the, the realistic situation is we're going to have particles which are going to be in a hindered environment. There's so many particles present that they interact and interfere with each other separately. They agglomerate into clusters and they settle faster and, and so on. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to this again later on. But I asked you at the end of the class to watch that little video, the guy with the British accent and the, the simulation of the, the settling. And I'm not going to watch it in this class today. Um, but I'm going to use the principle of that in the class and I'll uh, have a little illustration in a minute to, to continue on. But I thought, just, just to help um, with today's class, I, I realized that last class I was starting to use terminology that I hadn't really introduced yet. Uh, mainly the terms overflow and underflow. So let's take a look at what, what I mean by those. We have, let's see if I can get my points over here. I don't have my laser pointer, but um, at, the, at the top over there we have a feed line coming in and we'll talk about flocculation in a minute. But the feed is our raw material, the solid liquid mixture that we're, we're aiming to separate. And it comes into the center of the sedimentation vessel in what's called a feed well. So that feed well has, has a number of requirements, but the main is to dissipate the feed without disturbing the rest of the material in the base. And then the material spreads across the, the area of the basin and starts to settle down. At the bottom, we have a, a rotating rake. We've got this wheel, we'll talk a bit about in a minute. And the solids will settle and come to the center over there by the sloping base, and they re get removed in the stream that we call the underflow. So the underflow is the, the primary um, so, uh, stream, uh, sorry, it's a stream that consists primarily of solids. Then the overflow <coughs> over on the top left over there, and being circular, it actually exists all around this basin, um, is, uh, is, is primarily liquid with very little solids. So we have our feed, our overflow, and our underflow. Those are the two terms that um, I really want to introduce to this slide. The next slide here shows a bit more of the path that the solids take. So the solids will spread out across the, the basin. And then the liquid will, the clarified liquid tends to go up to the overflow base, uh, to the overflow water. And then the uh, thickened liquid, which consists of maybe between 5 to 20 percent solids, uh, sometimes a little bit more, comes out of the water. So that, that bottom stream actually contains quite a bit of liquid, um, but it's generally we're looking for about 20 to 30 percent solids by waste. In some, some processes, we're only looking for about 10 percent. By, uh, by mass of, of solids. Okay, so, so those those are some terms. And then in terms of the design, there's a top view and a side view again. So the details here are not so important. Uh, so don't worry about if you can't see the text. But the main point is that from the top view, 
It's a circular basin and we have a platform walkway across the basin that we, uh, for operators um, to maintain that motor and to clog any, um, any problems that happen at the feed well in the center over there. And then we have our rakes on the interior that rotate around and drive the solids from, from the sides to the center point for removal. So those are, the, those are the typical features. Very little in terms of the mechanical um, overhead. So there's a motor and that rotating rake. Okay, so here's where we're going to look at the preliminary design for the cross-sectional area. So in an unhindered settling environment, we have material settling at a constant rate. And even if it's hindered settling, we can calculate some average rate of settling for the material. We'll, we'll look at that in the next slide in, in the next bit. But what we've got is we've got this material that's settling down at some constant rate through, through the basin. And we've derived an equation for the velocity V, or we can use the laboratory tests to estimate that velocity V of sedimentation. And if we have to take that sedimentation vessel if we go, go look back over here, and I have to draw an imaginary cross-sectional line roughly through the center of the vessel, all the solid material has to pass through that imaginary line. So halfway from the bottom up, draw a horizontal line, the material comes through that center feed point over there. The solids, if they're all leaving in the underflow, which is our assumption over here, we're not taking any solids out in the overflow. So no, no real um, solids of any particular value are leaving in the overflow. Everything is leaving in the underflow. All that solid material must pass through this imaginary horizontal line. And if we look at that horizontal line, uh, we can calculate the mass in kilograms of solids <coughs> per unit time per unit area. So that's our mass flux. So flux is a, is a terminology we see over and over in physics. There's mass flux, there's energy flux, there's uh, heat flux, there's multiple types of fluxes we can look at. In this case, we're looking at the mass flux. So it's kilograms per unit time, tons per day, kilograms per hour, per unit area of the sedimentation vessel. So whatever the cross-sectional area is of, the, the, of that vessel. And we can calculate that, that mass flux by simply taking the total kilograms of solids that enter the vessel, which we know that we, or we were designed for, we are designing our vessel to be able to treat a certain kilograms of solids per meter cubed of feed. So we know what our incoming concentration of solids is per meter cubed of feed. That's C0. We also know what that sedimentation velocity is, either from a theoretical derivation or from a laboratory estimate. That V, that velocity measured in meters, uh, I realize it's error in the slide. We have seconds per meter. It should be meters per second over there. Okay. So just uh, fix up that last, that last term. Instead of seconds per meter, meters per second. So that's our, our mass flux. And if we simplify the units over there, we get kilograms of solids per second per meter squared. So just a simple rearrangement of the units over there on the right hand side, which I've messed up. Uh, but if, we, if I had it correct, it would still work out as shown here in this third last bullet point. That the units of flux then come up to what we expect. Kilograms of solids per second, or tons per day, or some units of mass per time <coughs> per unit area. And that flux is an important number because in, in, in this industry when they're designing these units, they, they don't uh, call it mass flux. In chem we would call this mass flux, but they would use the terminology loading rates. It's equivalent. So loading rate is the, is the critical design parameter for these units. So given a particular loading rate, we can now then plan for what the unit area is. Okay. So whenever these units are designed, the, the loading rate is the key design parameter. What is my, my volume of solids that I need to treat in, in, in which time frame per unit area? Now, the inverse of flux is actually quite easy to interpret as well. It's the unit area required to treat a certain mass feed rate. So you can see where this is going. We're heading towards the surface area or the cross-sectional area of this vessel. The flux is telling us 
what rate of feed we're receiving per unit area, but the inverse of flux is the unit area required to treat a given mass feed rate. And all of this, is, this derivation is a simple mass balance assuming everything is leaving the vessel through the underflow. No solids leaving through the underflow. Anything unclear with this point? This is, a, this is the key slide in today's class. These, this is the core concept for, for all of the is to understand what the design parameter is, its flux, and what the interpretation of it is. Okay, so I'll just pause here for a minute or two. If there's anything that you want to, to ask me, uh, please let me sure before we go on. So we're assuming steady state operation where we're continuously feeding the vessel and it's, the, the material is leaving either in the overflow or the, and in the underflow. All that solid material must pass through that imaginary line. That, that line is the line through which we're computing the flux. The other thing is when this vessel is operating at steady state, whatever that, the level that the sludge settles at stays constant. So we're, we're, we're on our assumed state of operation. <coughs> so then, the way to estimate a preliminary estimate of the area. So I must emphasize that after this class, after this course, you are not a normal eye, an expert at designing these sedimentation estimates. This is going to give us an initial estimate of the cross-sectional area. There's a number of other factors that add into adding increasing the area and decreasing the area. But this will give you a good ballpark estimate. The area required is to take the volumetric feed rate of fluid coming in, Q, meters cubed per hour, multiply that by the concentration of the feed, which is given in the usual units of kilograms of solid per meter cubed feed. So Q multiplied by C0 is giving us an estimate of kilograms of solids per unit time coming in. So Q times C0, so it's, it's a volumetric flow times its concentration gives us a, a, a mass flow. And if we divide that through by the flux, and we look at, at, at the units there, it cancels out quite nicely, well, as expected, and it gives us the cross-sectional areas. So if, we, if we take Q then and divide it through by that sedimentation velocity, after simplifying that equation, we're going to get an estimate of the cross-sectional area. So Q times C0 divided by the flux. Q times C0 is kilograms of solids per unit time. Flux is kilograms of solids per unit time per unit area. And the result of that then is, is the cross-sectional area that we require for the sedimentation. So that, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a seemingly simple equation, but it, it, it simplifies up nicely over there on the right. But I find the, the second term over there, where a is equal to q times c0 divided by plus, is actually more interpretable. If you just say q divided by v, sure, but where does that come from is, a little, is, is not obvious. It does simplify up to that quite nicely, but the, the more interpretable form of it is the mass feed rates divided by the mass feed rate required per unit area, which is the flux. Okay, so now that we're comfortable with this topic, I'm going to give you three, four minutes to design the cross-sectional area for a sedimentation vessel where the following experiment was performed in the lab. So we said last class that we, we almost never can compute the theoretical terminal settling velocity. So here we do a lab experiment that estimates the terminal setting set of velocity. Use that information over there where we're using a cylinder, um, 30 centimeters tall. We're filling it with a representative sample of material that we want to assemble. And the interface between the clear liquid and the solids drops from 500 millimeters to 215 millimeters in that four minute period. So 
if you watched that video uh, last class, you would have seen something along the lines of those over time. Let me actually go through this slide before we start the exercise that will help uh, just, to, just to get everyone to the same point. When we're doing these lab experiments, we're filling, filling this vessel, this cylinder A over here, with the, with the material we wish to set. And it's, so it's uniformly mixed at point A in time. So that's called the suspension. So it looks cloudy. And after a few minutes or seconds, we start to form this bottom layer of sediment in a very dark color, compacted sediment. Above that, we have a, a region which is sediment that's in much higher concentration that hasn't quite settled out yet. And then we have the rest of the suspension at the same concentration that we started off with above that third, as that third layer. So we've got four layers always, the compacted sediment, the transition layer where the concentration, there's a concentration gradient, and then we have this, this third layer, which is the original concentration that we started off with in the, in the vessel. Above that, we have the clear supernatant, which is mostly clear liquid with no solids. And what we're plotting over here with time of interest is the transition between layer three and four. So the transition between that clear supernatant and the suspension. And that's what's, what's being shown over there as the solid liquid interface that comes down at a uniform rate in time. So when we're doing these laboratory tests, what we're, we're, we're tracking is that interface height with time, and that's giving us an estimate of the sedimentation velocity V. Okay, so we, we don't calculate the theoretical sedimentation velocity V because of, of um, so many different reasons that it's, it's, it's a purely theoretical construct, but for real systems, that V value is not easily calculated. So we, we estimate it from laboratory measurements, and that's what's given here in an exercise for you. So let's take, a, let's take four or five minutes where we're seeing the interface dropping from a 500 millimeter mark on the cylinder to 250 millimeter mark in a four minute period. And then use that to estimate the area of the vessel required. So work with the, with the person to your left or your right, or in groups of three, and then
should be straightforward. It shouldn't be as complicated as, you know, as that. So let's take a look. So there's, there's your cylinder in the lab. It's 300 millimeters tall. But the graduations on the cylinder are in milliliters. So there's milliliters and milliliters in this question, so just pay attention to that. So it's, it's, it's about a foot tall cylinder, but the interface is dropping on the graduations from 500 to 215 milliliters. What we're interested in is a number V that we want. Uh, we want a number V that is in meters per second or millimeters per minute, something along those lines. So if, that, if that's dropping, we're aiming for something in millimeters per minute, we want to know what the velocity of that interface is in millimeters per minute or, or length of any time. If we're dropping from 500 to 250 millimeters, then the fraction that we've dropped is 500 minus 215 over 500. So that's the percentage drop on the side of the graduations multiplied by the height. That's going to give me some numbers. So 500 minus 215 is 171 millimeters in four minutes. So divide four. It's 42 millimeters, 43 millimeters, millimeters, let's say, um, per minute. sedimentation rate, the rate at which the interface is dropping, over designed by a factor of two based on the settling rate. So there's my settling rate. Should I double that or halve that? Half it, yeah. So it's, it's very common in engineering situations where we're getting lab values to say, well, that's my base case, but I'm not going to design my process for the base case. I'm going to design it for the worst case. So we then apply multiplicative factors usually to that. So if you read this in uh, the literature on sedimentation, <coughs> over-design factors are typically range between 1.5 to 5. They'll choose any number between 1.5 to multiply by or 5, um, uh, sorry, a factor of 5. And in some cases, when you're doing liquid gas separation, they're using factors of as much as 10. So here we're saying, let's over-design by a factor of 2. If we're setting at 43 millimeters per minute, if we're over-designing, we should halve that so we get something in the order of about 22 millimeters per minute. So let's use 22 millimeters per minute as um, <coughs> our sedimentation rate. So 22 millimeters per minute. That's my sedimentation velocity. Now I would like to calculate what the area is. So we've got that formula A is equal to Q times C0 divided by the flux. And the flux is equal to C0 times V. Okay, so what information do we have here? Do we have Q, C0? information to calculate the mass flow. We don't have the mass fraction of that feed or any of that sort of kilograms uh, feed rate information. But we do have that the waste stream is a total of 
2,100 liters per minute. So if we simplify that equation over there, Q times C0 divided by C0 times B, we get the simplification is Q divided by B. And then we have enough information. So we've got 2,100 liters per minute, or 2.1 meters cubed per minute, divided by 22 um, millimeters per minute. So that's 0 0.022 meters per minute. And we get a number that's in the order of about 100 meters squared. Give or take. So that's our cross-sectional area of estimate that's required. Now, there's this additional information that's given here. Account for 7 meters squared of entry area to eliminate turbulence in the industry. What, where that comes from is, is simply this. If we're looking at our sedimentation vessel, we need a cross-sectional area of 100 meters squared. But we're going to have this piece in the middle where we're feeding the material in. And there's an estimate that that area is going to be in the order of 7 meters squared. So we've removed 7 meters squared from the required surface area to have the settling area for the feed. So we need to account for that. So we need a 107 meters squared. So our total area total is required is then 100 plus 7. Okay. And then from that, you can go calculate the diameter of the sedimentation vessel. Anything unclear with that example? Okay, then the next part is, is asking you to estimate the loading rate. So this is your flux. Loading rate, if the feed concentration is given to you as 200 kilograms per meter cube of feed, what is the loading rate? Is it within the typical loading rate of, that's, that for this industry is our values between 50 and 120. So that's another reason why I, I want this to have this in mind is if you're designing a system and you calculate your loading rate and it's totally out of whack with what's the industry norm, then you've got a, you've got some issue there. Okay, you're designing a settler that's too big or too small for them that, that's normally done. So typical loading rates are in the order of 50 to 120 kilograms per day per square meter. So what is this vessel's loading rate is equal to, the loading rate is equal to, or psi is equal to C0 times V. That's giving us a concentration. Concentrations are given as 200 kilograms per meter cube of feed, multiplied by the settling velocity, which is 0 0.022 meters per minute. But those, those values of loading rates are given in, in days, units of days, so just multiply that out. So times 60 times 24. And that will get you your loading rate. So that will get you kilograms per meter squared per day. So that's minutes per day. So I'm still getting used to writing for the silence, and it's awful. Um, so 200 times 0.22 times 60 times 24. 200 times 0 0.022 times 60 times 24. And I think there's a factor of 1,000 that I'm missing there. So it's uh, 6.336. Uh, let me just check. Oh, yes, yeah, this is millimeters per minute. So there's, there's a, a divide by 1,000 to remove the millimeters and convert to meters. Okay, so let me just do that again because that's a bit confusing the way I did that. Um, so size C0 times V, which is 200 kilograms per meter squared of feed, multiplied by 0 0.022 millimeters per minute, multiplied by. Oh. Okay, okay, but yeah, so point, yeah. Yeah, it, it was 22 millimeters per minute, so that's times 0 0.22 meters per minute times 60 times 24 meters per day. And then that, so that is 6,000. Right. 
kilograms per meter squared per day. So that means that, that there's something that's way off over here. Right? So it, it could, our design, is, there's an issue there that we're trying to propose a design that's way out of, out of, out of industry norms. Unless, I'm sure I've made a, a mistake in the years because I, I was expecting a value of six for my load. 24 minutes, 60 times 24 minutes per day. So 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours per day. I must have a factor. I'll double check my numbers and then I'll correct it in tomorrow's class. But if this is correct, that this is indicating that my design is, is out of whack with industry norms.
The key thing here is that that initial settling rate, as you come to that point of inflection, which is called the critical point, is always constant. In all these laboratory experiments, it's quite interesting that that initial period of time over which we settle, that rate of in the interface dropping is constant with time. And there's a slide uh, uh, over here that I'm looking for over here. Yeah. So if we had to do one of those experiments in the lab, it would look something like that. So that interface height changing very, very uh, uniformly over time until so we reach that critical point, and that critical point is defined by when these, the solids in the bottom end start to slowly compact and, and get thicker and thicker. So one thing I just wanted to also talk about here is, is how we can go about accelerating that rate of sedimentation. Obviously, if we can sediment at a far, faster velocity, we'll need a smaller cross-sectional area, which will save on capital costs. So being able to increase the settling rate is really is, is the key point. Um, we see that from the equation that, that cross-sectional area is a function of inverse velocity. So the velocity is in the denominator. If we can increase that velocity, we need a smaller cross-sectional area. And there are a number of ways that we can do that. One is to modify the particle shape if, if possible. So spherical particles are the ideal situation, they settle the fastest. Anything else will settle the slower than that. Um, the other way we can, can modify things is to modify the fluid's density and viscosity. So if we have a choice to pick our fluid, we can pick a fluid with lower viscosity and lower density to increase the setting rate. But in most cases, we're going to be using water as our, as our fluid medium. There's a very few um, examples where we modify our fluid. One interesting application is called dense medium separation used in the diamond industry. So what's the density of a diamond? Give a take. 3,000 kilograms per meter cubed, 3,500, somewhere in that range. So diamonds, much, much heavier, much heavier than the, than the rest of the material that they occur with naturally on the ground. So the material they occur with in the ground is called gag. It's just sand, basically, and it's got a much, much lower density than diamond. So how would you separate diamond from sand? One way is to just use pure centrifugal force. So in many industries, uh, or many diamond separators, they just use a conveyor belt and they throw the material and diamond will travel further than the rest of the material. And the great thing is that you can, that, that process is extremely reliable. We can put it behind lock and key, and no operators can get to it and touch it, which is a critical issue in the diamond industry. But a, a newer application for separating diamonds is that they now mix the diamonds and the sand up in a mixture of iron and water. So that iron that they've added to the water, very high concentration, brown iron, creates a medium or a fluid of much, much higher density, and they choose the iron and the concentration of it to be very close to the density of diamond itself. So the, the diamond and this dense medium, the fluid and iron mixture, will travel will travel and, and stay together, and then the soil or the gang and the sand will, will not. And so they use uh, centrifugal force and, and, and in a dense medium to separate our diamonds from sand. And then another application that's uh, not related to sedimentation, but uh, diamonds also respond very strongly to a particular X-ray frequency. And so they'll have these processes where the diamonds are traveling along the conveyor belt for multiple X-rays. And as soon as the X-ray sees it, it then shoots a jet, jet of air out and, and throws the diamond out and leaves the sand behind. So we're concentrating out the diamond from the sand. So interesting use of density differences to, to separate. Um, but in general, we'll just use our regular fluid water, but it, it's possible to modify your fluid's viscosity and density to improve your separation efficiency. The other thing that, uh, that's done is we use rakes and stirrers at the bottom of those sedimentation vessels. Those rotate around and they create channels for two reasons. Those, they, those channels that get created by the rakes allow liquid that's being in, in, entrained in the solids to, to leave and, and move up and create new channels for all the solids to settle into and, and concentrate on. And then the other important way is by flocculation. So 
Flocculation is, um, is, a, is a chemical addition to the medium to, inc to improve setting. So I'm going to end off the class by, by looking at this video. It's a five minute video. The intention with me showing videos in the class isn't to, um, it's the reason why I use it is because these videos are, are so well put together, I couldn't possibly demonstrate flocculation as well as, as this. But I do want you to um, see this as part of the lecture. So whenever I do use video material in the class, it's as if I'm presenting it. So don't feel this is just something for you to sit back and watch. Um, this is, is part of the course and will be part of the exams and so on. So let's, uh, let's just take a look at this video here produced by students at MIT.
double layer provides a whole set of warps that prevents two colloids from sticking to each other. Once the flocculant is added, it adheres to the surfaces of the particle. Compressing the double layer and allowing the colloids to stick to each other and form flocks. These flocks are now heavy enough to settle to the bottom by gravity. Given how effective flocculation is, many countries around the world use this method for cleaning their water supplies. Did you know that Singapore, for instance, produces drinking water from sewer water using a number of methods, including flocculation? As the global population increases and fresh water resources become more and more scarce, flocculation 